So a lot of times, because of what I know about fermentation and microbiology, it's hard for me to put myself in the shoes of people that are less familiar to know what is still confusing or how I can best explain things. So we asked you what is still confusing and now I'm gonna to respond to your questions. Is it all coffee that is anaerobic aerobic coffee. You have to have like a little bit of a foundation. So when we're talking about processing, there is the term anaerobic that's kind of come up in conjunction with fermentation. It's like a, a adjective to describe the fermentation and anaerobic fermentation, which is really scientifically factually incorrect because all fermentation by definition is anaerobic. So we don't need to qualify it. The way that I talk about it is like saying, you know, wet water water by its nature is wet. Wetness is already a property of water. We don't need to then tack on and say wet water. So saying an anaerobic fermentation is about as dumb as saying wet water. Now, I think what most people mean colloquially is that the environment in which the fermentation is taking place is in a sealed container. And that would give the coffee different flavor properties, but the fermentation itself is unchanged. The fermentation happens with yeast and bacteria breaking down glucose, creating flavor precursors, and that happens with or without oxygen participating in there. Clarifying whether the fermentation itself is anaerobic or aerobic is neither here nor there. I think it's uh, a way to sound more technical where if you are talking to somebody who understands microbiology, you actually sound less intelligent because you're describing a process that doesn't need description. So the utility of the word anaerobic to describe the fermentation is pretty weak. But we still can't deny that sealing the fermentation, sealing the coffee, can have a different impact than when the fermentation is in the open environment. So I think that part of the confusion is trying to define something that really doesn't need a definition. It's much more about the environment and not the style or the type of fermentation. I think another thing to keep in mind is what this question is presupposing is that it's always a binary. It's either anaerobic or aerobic. It's either on or off. And microbiology mostly works on a spectrum. It's mostly a sliding scale of different levels of oxygen. So you can have something that has very low levels of oxygen that you could call an anaerobic environment, or you can have low levels, medium levels, high levels of oxygen, which would select for different microbes. So it starts to get really complicated. And again, it's like unnecessary to really talk about flavors and talk about what's happening in our cup at the end of the day. So I don't love to like clarify some of these examples because I think then people like hold on to them more tightly and try to connect a description of a process to a flavor in a cup. And I don't think that's particularly useful and I don't think that's particularly interesting. So in my world, <laughs> if I could have a, a wish, it would be that this stops being this anaerobic or aerobic adjective description or even conversation is really toned down. I don't think it's very helpful. I, I think it's much more confusing. I don't think it's really adding to the conversation of coffee quality or coffee flavors or even processing. So I would love to see this really be let go. Next question is, am I aware of any efforts to design yeast specifically for Robusta? So the short answer is no, I am not aware of any efforts to design yeast specifically for Robusta. And then additionally, I don't think it's necessary. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say all of the yeast that is commercially available for Arabica that I've, I'm aware of and have used is perfectly suited to also work with Robusta. And I don't think that there needs to be anything specific developed for Robusta. I think it's enough of a challenge. It has been in my 10 years of experience working with producers and fermenting coffee. It's been enough of a struggle to get Arabica adoption for, you know, just widespread information and adoption of one type of yeast for the companies to then invest very specifically on a different tier or a different level of products when their main product that works for both is already struggling for adoption. So I don't see that to be something in the near future. And 
I also believe that anything that would be designed specifically for Robusta would be, you know, more expensive because then you'd have to pay for the research and development to select that yeast and for the information from that. And you might get, I don't know, 5% better performance than a thing that already exists. So not only am I not aware of a product that any development. Um, I don't think it's particularly necessary. And then once it came out, I would be really hesitant to recommend it because I wouldn't see the need. You know, it's it's solving a problem that nobody is asking about. The next question is, uh, do I think producers should create terms that further describe processing? This one's a little bit tricky because I... I do not. <laughs> Sorry, simple answer. I do not. No, I, I, don't, I don't think that the problem or the barrier to people uh, paying fair prices for coffee and to recognize coffee quality is that we've had a lack of words to describe the processing. Like that hasn't been the bottleneck. There's way bigger social structures. There's way bigger cultural issues. There's way bigger political issues that are preventing that from happening. So I don't think that coffee hasn't been valued because we don't, producers don't have enough words to describe processing. Along that vein, when I sell coffee that I've processed and when I consult with producers, my advice is to make your processing simpler. I'm a big fan of going back to simpler terms and just describing coffees as wash coffees. So even if they are fermented with certain Saccharomyces yeast that are inoculated, um, even if the container is, you know, a sealed container, it it's still, for me, a washed coffee if we remove the cascara and are processing it that way. So I really like the kind of two channels of naturals are processed whole fruit and washed coffees are processed pulped without that outer tissue. So I believe that keeping it really simple and focusing on other things, focusing on the genetics, focusing on less tangible things about the, the producers uh, in terms of farming practices or the values, that is much more of a selling point because again, we're talking about marketing. So using words to describe processing for me is a very weak way to market your coffee when there are other levers that producers can pull that are already available to them without making any investments. So like highlighting things that make your coffee special that don't have to do with processing. As an addendum to this, that might not be that intuitive. So while I don't think that producers should create more terms to describe processing, like the along the veins of the triple anaerobic hydro honey style, I actually do really like fantasy names. I like when a coffee process is called like galaxy process, you know, something that is completely divorced from science, like we can't pretend that it's scientific. And I think it's a way for producers to have fun, um, to signal that they're doing something out of the ordinary and that it invites more questions. So I think that in a way it could be perceived as, oh, you're obscuring, you're you know, not sharing the information, but I also don't think that we should, as buyers, think that we are entitled to a producer's you know, recipe. That's their intellectual property. So I think it's very valid for a producer to say, this is my unicorn process, and then they are allowed to share what that means if they want to or not. I think that's, that's their information to share or not. So those are like my two areas. Like I want really simple, like this is just a washed or this is a natural, or this is Milky Way fantasy coffee processing. The next question is how to more precisely measure fermentation process with whole cherries. This is a great question because it highlights the challenges that whole cherry processing gives us when we are trying to understand the fermentation, when we're trying to understand the activity of yeast and bacteria. And whole cherry is a big challenge. It's really difficult to know what's happening inside the tank because each cherry it's its own bioreactor it's a self-contained unit of metabolic activity so when you are doing a fermentation like that each individual cherry is experiencing its own fermentation its own different fermentation rate because each cherry is starting with a different moisture content depending on how ripe it is a different sugar content depending on how ripe it is and different microbes kind of on the outside that are able to interact with said sugar and said moisture so it's incredibly difficult to predict or to control those fermentations. So no, I don't know any way to do it. That's why I don't do those fermentations. That's not my preference. I will do them if I have to, if forced, we will do whole cherry fermentations. 
and there are ways that we can make that process a little bit more stable but it's still a guess because measuring is really challenging because each individual cherry is a unit now when i pulp the coffee and i i can have much more of a uniform mass because i'm taking off those tissue layers i have more access to what's on the inside i can have a submerged fermentation so each of my coffee seeds has a much more similar moisture content, and I'm also spreading out that sugar availability. So wash process, pulp coffees, have much more consistency within the batch because they're not individual bioreactor units, and it's easier for me to read the pH of that mass and get some information about what's happening in my fermentation. Whereas if you're getting the pH of a whole cherry fermentation, usually you don't have liquid, so you need some liquid to be able to measure pH. So it's really impossible. So my push isn't, hey, let's have more toys and more technology to better measure this. We can just process in an easier way with the caveat of having water and having the structures available to do that. So while there, I'm not aware of the tools and instruments to better measure what's going on in a whole cherry fermentation, what I do to work around that lack is I ferment whole cherries the way that I do my wash coffees, meaning that it's submerged, so I'm trying to even out the moisture content more, and I'm also inoculating. I'm controlling the microbes that are present in the fermentation. So it's a two-pronged approach to be able to reduce the differences so that my lack of measurements is less important. I don't need to be hyper aware of what's happening in my fermentation from a measurements point of view, following my pH and my temperatures, because I'm compensating by submerged inoculated fermentations. So one thing allows me to relax on the other thing. And that's why when you're not inoculating and you're not submerging, yeah, t measurements become much more important, but we don't have those tools yet. So until we do, I use those methods that are available right now. Okay, so the next question is, what's the most eco-friendly way to treat wastewater and effluent? Um, this is not my area of expertise um, in terms of wastewater and managing ecological systems, but I will tell you about my experience. And this question is hard to answer because it has within it the word the most ecological. And out of all of the methods, I don't know which one is the most efficient, but I will tell you that any farm that's doing anything at all is helpful because I've been to so many places where there's no government oversight, there are no external pressures to treat your wastewater, and so most of the wastewater from the fermentations or processing goes into rivers or into the groundwater. There's like no filter, there's no layer of protection between the water that we're producing in the mill and the outside environment. So that's throughout the world and many countries that I visited, that's just the reality. I don't think that the systems need to be so expensive or involved. It's just, an, I think, an educational problem of having different, you know, settling pools, different settling ponds, including some aquatic life so that you can reoxygenate the water. Because that's the biggest challenge. If, you know, you've been aware of the conversations with fermentation, it's that all fermentations are anaerobic, meaning that oxygen is not part of it. And as the fermentation is happening, there's more CO2 that's being carbon dioxide that's being released. And so there's dissolved oxygen in water. So you already have some amount of oxygen there, but when you ferment that water, you are reducing the oxygen content in that water. And so when you're done with the fermentation, you have a substance that is really, really low oxygen availability and high acid, right? Really low pH because the fermentation produces organic acids. So you have something that's pretty toxic. And this is just any fermentation ever. This isn't specific to inoculated fermentations. This is just the way that coffee's processed. So this water is very charged with organic matter, very little oxygen. And so most of that time, that water goes from the fermentation tank into the environment, into rivers and drinking water. And the problem there is that because of that low oxygen, it deprives the oxygen for fish and plant life. So it's something that we don't talk about enough that I would love to see more attention, but I'm, I'm just not the person to recommend a system. I'm just letting you know that that water should be paid attention to much more than we do now. So thanks for the questions. Um, this was really helpful for me to kind of wrap my head around what is still confusing. And I think it's possible that these answers may have sparked even more questions. So not a problem, keep them coming. I love talking about this stuff.